Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mom coming at you. Today we're taking a look at an uh, A-Push a -push video focusing in on Topic 4.8. Uh, taking a look, at least in this video, at the election of 1824 and the Adams, John Quincy Adams presidency. Uh, but before we can get into the Adams presidency, we have to talk about how John Quincy Adams actually becomes president of the United States. And for that to happen, boy, do we got a wild election, the election of 1824. So let's break down who the uh, contenders are in this battle, in this matchup here. Uh, now, uh, you got some heavy hitters here. Uh, first off, from Kentucky, you got Henry Clay, who has already made a name for himself as the leader of the War Hawks that kind of helped get us into the War of 1812. He is also the uh, choreographer of the Missouri Compromise. Uh, he is also the uh, developer of what's going to be called the American System, which is going to be trying to use federal funds for internal improvements, you know, infrastructure, schools, stuff like that. Uh, you got William Crawford down here from Georgia, longtime uh, politician. You got John Quincy Adams over here, son of former President John Adams. John Quincy Adams has you know, quite a resume in government by the time we get to 1824. Uh, this guy had been an ambassador to just about every major European country by this point in time. Uh, he was also Secretary of State during the uh, Monroe presidency. Uh, he's the, the writer of the Monroe Doctrine. He also negotiated uh, the end of the War of 1812 with the Treaty of Ghent. He also is going to be responsible for negotiating uh, border issues with British Canada to the north and Spain to the southwest. So John Quincy Adams has quite a resume. In fact, one of the most impressive resumes of any candidate for president. And then lastly, Andrew Jackson, uh, who has now become a national superstar out of the result of being a military hero. First off with victories against the Creek at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and then, of course, the you know very, very famous victory at the Battle of New Orleans, which many consider to be you know what is going to bring Britain to the bargaining table to end the War of 1812, even though, in fact, the Treaty of Ghent had already been signed prior to the Battle of New Orleans. So uh, we got a number of heavy hitters all running for the election, or all running for president in this election. The first time we've truly had a really competitive election in, in a generation. So, uh, you know, this shows signs of a lot more parity amongst the popular candidates and really in many respects the beginning of the end of what is going to be the Democratic Repar uh, Republican Party as a singular dominant party in American governing. So, what happens in the election? Well, if you take a look at the, uh, the voting results here in terms of the Electoral College votes, you can see that, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, splitting up of support primarily based on different regions of the country. If you take a look at the Northeast, what was the old traditional Federalist Party in its day, this is going to be coming out in, in big support for John Quincy Adams. Not a surprise. He's from Massachusetts. Uh, he's probably the most, what we consider to be old school Federalist leaning of the candidates. So not a surprise that he gets that kind of support there. New York is going to be a major uh, you know, a major uh, uh, achievement for Adams as well. Uh, and then you've got Henry Clay, who's going to have most of his support really out in the West, including his home state of Kentucky. You've also got William Crawford, who's going to get support in a few southern slave states, including his own home state of Georgia. And then with the plurality of the popular vote and the plurality of the Electoral College vote is Andrew Jackson, who's going to be able to cobble together support from the Mid-Atlantic, the West and the Deep South for his support. So, so Jackson's certainly going to have the broadest base of support from the results of the election. He's going to have more votes than any other candidates uh, with plurality. But note, the word I'm using is plurality, not majority. Per the Constitution, you cannot become elected President of the United States without a majority of the Electoral College votes. And none of these four candidates has that. So what does this then mean? Well, then it means that according to the Constitution, as we saw in 1800 when you know, nobody had a majority in the Electoral College there as well, it goes to the House of Representatives. And in fact, this is the only the second time ever, in fact, it's the second of only two times ever that the House of Representatives will actually elect the President of the United States. Now, 
per the Constitution, it's the top three electoral college vote getters that are considered finalists for this uh, election in the House, which means that uh, Henry Clay, who was the last of these four candidates in terms of electoral college votes, was now out. So it's now down to Crawford, Adams, and John or Jackson. But then in the process, William Crawford passes away. So now it goes from a three-way race down to a two-man race. It's now Adams versus Jackson, the guys that had the most popular and electoral votes to be determined by the House of Representatives. But now, but no, even though Clay is out of the election, that doesn't mean that he doesn't stop. That doesn't mean that he stops having a, a role in the outcome of the election. Henry Clay has become a major player in Congress. And he's going to be able to use that power and influence to sway votes in these various state delegations. And Henry Clay will basically form an alliance with John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy Adams will be able to use Henry Clay's influence to gain more of these state delegations for support. And in the end, even though Andrew Jackson goes into the House race with more popular votes and more electoral college votes, than John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams form that alliance and are able to get John Quincy Adams a majority of the House state delegations to give him the majority to, excuse me, to allow him to win the election of 1824, much to Andrew Jackson and his supporters' chagrin, especially with what happens next. When John Quincy Adams becomes president, he is, of course, able to appoint, you know, the top level, you know, cabinet positions. And the most coveted of these positions by far was Secretary of State. Secretary of State has, by this point in time, served as kind of a stepping stone to becoming President of the United States. You know, previous Secretaries of State, such as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and now John Quincy Adams, have all gone on to be President. So the thought was, if you become Secretary of State, you become a very, very strong candidate. In fact, maybe a likely future president. Well, who does John Quincy Adams bestow with this important honor? Henry Clay, the guy that helped him get elected president. Well, this is going to make Jackson and his supporters howl. They're going to be claiming that, you know, what this is is really a corrupt bargain. That, you know, basically a deal was made, a shady deal was made behind closed doors Jackson making the allegation that Adams tells Clay that if you get me the votes to become president, I will make you Secretary of State and, in essence, make you my presidential successor. So, note, Jackson does not lose gracefully. Jackson believes that he has been swindled out of his uh, rightful victory as President of the United States, and Jackson will never forget it. And more importantly, he will never let his supporters forget it because Here's basically what's going to happen. Jackson and his supporters, out of a sense of feeling cheated in this election, are going to make it their personal mission to make the next four years of John Quincy Adams' life a living hell. Uh, they basically want to really, really, really uh, strangle John Quincy Adams' presidency. And they do a pretty darn good job of that. So let's dive into this uh, John Quincy Adams presidency. Now, uh, John Quincy Adams, even though he is, you know, a Democrat Republican, that's pretty much the only party in town anymore. Uh, John Quincy Adams had a lot of what was the old time, you know, kind of Federalist sympathies in terms of what he supported. And what that includes is support for the idea of a stronger, more robust federal government, uh, you know, kind of in that Hamiltonian sense, and a federal government that would take on more responsibilities in contrast with more traditional Democrat Republicans like Andrew Jackson, for example, uh, or Jefferson and Madison Monroe that believe that the federal government should be small and let most of the responsibilities of governing really be taken on by the states. So Adams is going to be pushing for support of what is Henry Clay's American system program. So, you know, more support for using federal funds to build national roads and federally funded universities, heck, even funding for a, an, an observatory. Uh, but when this is brought to Congress, uh, Congress is controlled you know, more by uh, Jackson supporters than John Quincy Adams supporters. So note, these Jackson supporters, as you, can, as you saw from the Electoral College map, 
are mostly going to be from the southern and western portions of the United States. And these folks did not have that old-timey Federalist notion of what the federal government should be doing. So when the American system is proposed by Adams and brought to Congress and you know, kind of championed by Henry Clay, they're going to be strongly opposed to it. They're going to see it as a waste of taxpayer dollars. They're going to see this as you know, an encroachment of federal power at the state's expense. And in fact, Jackson and, and many of his supporters are going to just straight up call the American system unconstitutional, that this was something that was beyond the purview, beyond the constitutional uh, boundaries of the federal government. So basically, Jackson's supporters, you know, the, what are now starting to eventually become what we would call the Democrats, are, are going to start to kill the American system uh, plan in Congress. Uh, and as controversial as the American system proposal was, that's going to be nothing compared to what is going to be the tariff bill of 1828. Now, the tariff bill of 1828 is going to be thrown in into Congress as a way to kind of put John Quincy Adams in a bit of a bind politically. The tariff of 1828 is going to propose to raise significantly the amount of tariff rates for imported goods. Now, this is something that Federalists would traditionally support. Federal, you know, old school Federalists, I should say, people like Adams, folks from New England, are going to be traditionally supportive of higher tariffs because not only does it bring in more revenue for the federal government to expand more, you know, opportunities using the federal government's power, but it's also going to be good for American businesses. Remember, we're now viewing tariffs as a protectionist type of strategy. So, in other words, using the tariff to make foreign competition for goods more expensive, therefore, you know, making the American products more uh, appealing in terms of price. But remember, Southerners and Westerners hate tariffs because even though the New England business owners are going to profit off of the use of tariff policy, remember, as we've said before, what do tariffs do overall? They overall have an impact of making prices of not just the foreign good, but the American good more as well. Because once you have, like, let's say, for example, that, you know, the tariff being implemented creates a $5 difference between the American and the foreign good. Well, now, since it's capitalism, the American company is not going to just leave that gap at $5, you know, for the difference. They'll raise their price to try to maximize profit and maybe shrink that difference down to $2. In other words, still cheaper than the foreign competition, but now able to make more money off of the tariff. And note, Southerners and Westerners are really more of the consumers of this. So what this does is really outrage these Southern and Western members of Congress. These folks are traditional members of, traditional supporters of Andrew Jackson, old school Democrat folks. Uh, and they will call this the tariff of abominations. And think of that word, abomination. You know, that, that's, you know, that's like something that's like almost of biblical level uh, language in terms of strength and power. You know, the idea being is that this is not just a tariff that they disagree with. They believe that this tariff is an abomination, and an abomination is defined as something that is just purely evil, something that is monstrous, something that is unholy by definition. So that shows you that they were more than just a little bit mildly opposed to, to this tariff. Uh, so what does this do? Well, with Adams' support for this tariff, it then clearly shows to many folks in the South and the West that President Adams is willing to you know, raise prices for you as a consumer and not really care about your overall standard of living. And this is only going to help Jackson in his bid to unseat his rival, John Quincy Adams. Uh, the John Quincy Adams presidency is going to, in many respects, be a parallel of his father's presidency. Uh, it is going to be very limited in success. Uh, they will be one-term presidencies. They will both... Uh, be limited by their inability to really work well across party lines, and both men are going to be known for their stubbornness as president. So the John Quincy Adams presidency, uh, not that long, not that effective, and we'll talk next time about how Jackson will finally pull off the common man revolution and unseat John Quincy Adams. Until next time, take it easy. We'll see you later.